Okay. All right, welcome back. Uh, let me just post the next. Okay, so Paul is warning the church here against false apostles. Now, who are they? Uh, just a few things here. Uh, in verse 20, he lists them. They are deceitful workers who either conceal the truth or misinterpret the truth for personal gain. Though they are unrighteous, they disguise in order to portray themselves as apostles of Christ and ministers of righteousness, just like how Satan did it, right? So two things. One, they are deceitful workers. They conceal the truth or they misrepresent the truth for their own personal gain. And they, they are unrighteous, but they walk around as if they are righteous ministers of God uh, and as if they, were, they are the apostles of Christ and uh, God has called them uh, for the work. Now, thirdly, their end, their reward will be according to their works. So this is a serious warning to the churches regarding false prophets. Right now, when you look around us, there will be many, many kinds of teachings, false teachings that may crop up. Right now, as ministers of God, as children of God, always test every scripture through the word of God through the eyes of God's word, right? And so we must be careful uh, of, from, from, of what we are watching online, what we are reading. What, so just be careful. Know that uh, whatever we are doing, uh, or whatever we are believing, must be in line with God's word, right? Now, picture this, though. False teachings has already started uh, right from the early church, and it continues on even now. Right, so it's again the same tactics that the enemy uses. Right, verse 16 onwards. I say again, let no one think me a fool, if otherwise at least receive me as a fool, that I also may boast a little. What I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were, foolishly, in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast. For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise. For you put up with it if one brings you into bondage, if one de devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face. To our shame, I say that we, are, we were too weak for that. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Now, Paul is exposing the manner in which the Corinthian church was tolerating this foolishness of these false ministers. And he's saying, now, when I write a letter, and that letter was just a letter of correction. You know, some of you were, were not tolerating that. But now, you've got these ministers of God who have come into the church. You're tolerating this foolish teachings. Right? You put up with them. You put up with these uh, fools as if they are wise. You think you are wise by putting up with these people, right? If they take from you, if if they are people who put you into bondage, you are still putting up with them, right? So Paul is saying, don't tolerate them. You are tolerating them with their boasting. How much more should we not boast for what we have done? for the church in Corinth. We have done what is right, what is true. We ourselves are boasting very less. These people are coming in and doing everything wrong, and they're boasting about it. So this applies even to the modern day churches. Uh, you know, there are ministries of the false apostles, false teachers. And here's what it is. We shall know them by their fruit. God will judge them, but we must again uh, just be careful. Uh, see that you know we are following the right, looking at God's word, uh, and you know there are ways to we can understand that okay, this is what they are speaking is true because sometimes they are like 
they are like wolves in sheep's clothing. So you can't really make out. But through the word, through the eyes of the word of God, we will be able to uh, make out that difference. Now look at this list Paul comes up with, right? Sufferings for Christ. He's saying, now these people who came up to church and they're saying, I did this, I did that. And uh, they're extorting from you and they're you know, giving all kinds of reasons, giving all kinds of teachings. You're putting up with them. Now, just look at the list of things that I have gone through. Are you? Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes, above measure, in prison, more frequently, in deaths, often. For the from the Jews, five times I received the forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been deep. I have been in the deep, in the seas, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in the perils of in the city. The perils in the wilderness, the perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak, and I am not weak, who's made to stumble. And I do not burn, and I do not burn with indignation. Now Paul is giving this whole list, and he's ending it in verse twenty-nine. He's saying the church is yet weak because I am concerned about the church, but I am not weak. Look at that confidence that Paul is talking in. He's giving this whole list, and he's saying, "Still, I'm not weak. I'm not weak in dealing with the enemy. I'm not weak in dealing with." These false prophets are not weak in dealing with the church. Are not weak in dealing with the ministry. Right? What a powerful, powerful declaration that is. The church is going to isn't going to stumble. Now I've gone through all these difficulties. The church is going to stumble. Should I not burn with indignation? Whole indignation is holy anger. We see that word indignation being used even uh, uh, when the Lord Jesus in in the book of Matthew, he was he was he was full of indignation. He spoke to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, gave a whole list of things there. So he says, "Godly anger, because of what I've gone through, I'm still not weak. I will deal with these people who are coming into the church, because the church is God's it's God's God's kingdom. It's God's it's the body of Christ." Verse thirty one. Sorry, verse 30, if I must boast, I will boast, boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. The Damascus, the governor under Aratus, the king, was guarding the city of Damascenus with a garrison desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped. From his hands. Now I wonder why the he came up with these verse thirty two and thirty three. All of a sudden, he's talking about what happened. You know, when he went to Damascus, he uh, when his eyes were open, he briefly ministered over there, and they were you know trying to catch him and put him down in a basket, and then they never saw him again after that. So it was for many many years. He uh, from he went on to uh, Tarsus, and then. The whole thing happened there. So uh, I wonder why he brought this up in 32 and 33. Uh, because here, 22 onwards, he's talking about his credentials and the sufferings. 32 and 33, he's just talking about how he uh, moved away and how he escaped from his hands. Right? Now, Paul starts with this bold and foolish boasting by asking four questions. He says, are they Hebrews? I am more than that. Are they Israelites? I am more Israel. I have the blood of the Israelites more than anybody else. Are they the seed of Abraham? I am more. 
Are they ministers of Christ? I am more. Right? Now Paul is saying the qualifiers, all are yes. Right? His boast was his boasting was that I qualify for everything here. Right? Uh, and, and the seed of Abraham, an Hebrew, an Israelite, everything I have, yet he's saying these so called qualifications are. Uh, the false apostles, they mean nothing. Right? Uh, the false apostles seem to have deviated from this idea and began, began to exalt themselves. Right? They've been using the term minister as an inflated title to exploit the church in Corinth. So now Paul is saying, they're all saying, you know, I'm a minister or apostle or prophet, whatever they're saying, let them say. But I am more than all of that. Look at the intense hard work and tiredness that he has gone he, that he has gone through. Stripes, imprisonment, deaths, whippings. Right? Five times the lashes from the Jews. Each whipping was thirty-nine. So thirty-nine into five. Beaten with rods, stored, shipwrecked, in the ocean for one day and one night. Facing dangers with robbers, dangers from the Jews, Gentiles, hungry. Look at that list. He was he he. Paul is saying, uh, this this is perhaps the most difficult scene that I have gone through. But I am still not weak. I'm not weak in dealing with these false apostles, and I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to exhort you, encourage you. To put them out of the church because they are infiltrating the church. Right? And he ends that whole chapter there. He goes on to boast in verse 12, in chapter 12. Here he goes on to boast about what how he is different, his spiritual experience, and the grace that he received to handle the thorn in the flesh, and how. The, those challenges, those difficulties, he was able to overcome by the grace of God. Look at this, verse 12. He's continuing. Now, there, that was more of the physical challenges that he went through. Now he's talking about something in the spirit that helped him to go through those physical challenges. The vision of paradise. Verse 1. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions. And revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a one was caught up in the third heavens. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, but God knows. How he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a for I will but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me, sees me to be, or hears from me. Look at Paul. Although his boasting about his revelations of the visions and revelations of the Lord. He chooses to share this. He doesn't want to share it so that people, you know, may should think of him above what he is. So nobody, Paul is saying, I'm sharing this, I'm sharing portions of it so that when people look at me, they should feel that, oh, this was Paul. Paul. He went up the third heaven and came back. So they should not see him above what he is. You see the humility there. That this is the first time Paul is sharing an experience. Uh, to uh, in any in all of his epistles in the church, right? Uh, he shares that this third person, referring to himself as a man of Christ. Now, why did he do this? Probably because he wanted to take the focus off himself. So Paul is saying, you know, a person, right, who went up to the third heavens, 
but what he saw in those third heavens is more important than the person who went there. He does not dwell or boast on this experience. He refrains from that. Because if he does so, people may call him a super apostle, or a celebrity, or uh, you know, they may they may look at him as, oh, we can't come near Apostle Paul. But Paul didn't want that. Now look at the contrast. A false prophet will want all the attention to themselves. Look at the Apostle Paul. He has so many things to boast of. Probably he, uh, he had two pages to you know talk about this one experience, but he doesn't. He just says, "I know. I went up to the third heaven. I saw things that was that I will. I cannot even speak about." But he could have listed it, or he could have written it down in two, three pages, probably. But he didn't do that because he didn't want. The attention to come to himself. Here, they want the attention. They started calling themselves as ministers. Here, Paul is saying the things that I've gone through, yet I don't want the attention to be on myself. Look at that contrast, right? And it's a very important lesson for us. God will use us in many ways. God may do wonderful signs but, and use us uh, in great ways. It's wonderful. But the attention, the and the focus should never be upon us. It should be on what God is doing. Right? Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I am strong. Now, let's talk about the thorn in the flesh. It's very, very important because there are different understandings about the thorn in the flesh, right? Now, all scripture must be interpreted in light of the rest of the scripture and in light of the person of Jesus Christ. Right? Now, okay, anything that we claim, anything that is not aligned to Jesus must be questioned and discarded. Jesus Christ is perfect theology, his word who became flesh. Now, the apostle Paul received great revelations he had great encounters paul understood and wrote about it now god permitted a thorn in the flesh now what is this thorn in the flesh some say it is a sickness some say it was an eye problem some say it was a hand problem because one was uh, when he was stoned uh, it was most probable that they would they would stone Always, like you see the stoning of Stephen, they would stone towards the face area, right? And because of that whole list of challenges and beatings that he went through, he probably had hundreds of thorns in the flesh, meaning of hundreds of pains in his body. The entire body may have been bruised and beaten. Now, Paul states here clearly, he says, a thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan. The word messenger in the Greek means angel, right? So the angel of the church in the book of Revelation, right? Uh, so the messenger of Satan was a spiritual being, could be a demon that was constantly opposed, that constantly opposed Paul in his ministry, right? Buffering him, striking him continuously, right? Now, in the previous chapter, we saw, right, Paul is explaining all the challenges that he went through. The troubles, the hardships, the weakness he endured. Now, what does he say there? That whole, after the whole is, while some of these hardships he took upon himself, many of these came in opposition to the work he was doing. Right? Uh, look at this word here. All of these serve to keep him, 
keep his feet on the ground, help him walk in humility, knowing that he had to depend on the Lord. Now, what did he pray? Paul prayed three times that these demonic op uh, oppositions to be gone. Right? He prayed, God, and I, probably he's thinking, when I go, in, when I'm going towards this Macedonia, why are people? You remember Ephesus? They were like beasts. They were trying to devour him and kill him. The, that is thorn in the flesh to his ministry. All these served to, for him to keep his ground, saying, God, I have to depend on you. Three times he prayed for this demonic work to be gone. God simply did not take the messenger out of the way. Instead, he called Paul to rely on his grace, continuing to press forward and overcoming what the demon was doing. Right? So, uh, I'll come to the question, but let me just complete this. Right? Paul understood that even in his weakest moments, God's grace was enough to keep him strong. Even, imagine this, five times, 40 lashes minus one. Those beatings would have been really, really painful ones. And even in his weakest moments, God's grace was with him. God's grace was more abundant. And as believers today, you and I have received such abundance of grace. Every time we have a revelation, uh, every time the Lord speaks to us, it must keep us grounded in humility. Now, the wrong way to look at it is by saying, Oh, there's a thorn in my flesh. God has allowed this. Uh, sickness in my body so that I can continue to be humble and look to God. That is a wrong understanding. Why? Because the Lord Jesus says, by your stripes I am healed. By the stripes of Jesus I am healed. The Lord Jesus has, wants to heal us. right? Uh, to claim that the thorn of the flesh is a, is a spiritual purpose for God to use us to continue to Look to us, now the thorn in the flesh is there so that I can, uh, we must fight sickness. Uh, all that is wrong. Uh, meaning, uh, we, we, we must not allow that sickness to stay and say, okay, this is a thorn which God has given me. I will stay with this thorn. But God, with this thorn, your grace is sufficient for me. Now, I have heard a lot of people, you know, they've got you know, people who have had cancer. Oh, it's a thorn in the flesh. Right, God has given me this thorn. I have to live with it. No. Can God heal cancers? Yes. So we must take scripture and light with all scripture. Paul is talking about the thorn in the flesh, which refers to more of the ministry, the thorn, the work of the devil attacking his ministry. And Paul is praying, God, can you stop this thorn? Can you take away this? Maybe it was Macedonia. Maybe while Remember, he, uh, uh, Paul was, uh, he's leaving Ephesus and uh, they were crying. Why? Because he's going to go to Jerusalem. They know they're going to, he's going to be persecuted. He may be even killed in Jerusalem. The Ephesian elders are saying, don't go there. But Paul is saying, oh, I have to go there. He knew the challenges. He knew that the enemy is going to buffet him, cause these problems. Paul is praying, take out these thorns, Lord. Take out these problems. But God did not. God said, even in those problems, my grace is sufficient for you. Yes, uh, I think there's a question here. Sri Kumar has raised his hand. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, I want to know uh, when the Paul is mentioning here yes. that um, uh, this, this is uh, given to me so that I should not exalt about measure. So. Uh, yes, we know that um, because of um, the um, the level of revelation what he was having, so, so that he should not maybe that is something which um, he should not walk in in pride or something like that. God has given this. So my question is when when the Paul is saying this that it is given to me so that I should not be exalted above the measure. So. Um, uh, how we have to understand this that line whether the god allowed it or uh, 
or how you say that you know uh, whether god permitted him that the the satan to satan to uh, persecute him how how uh, we will uh, we will able to um, interpret that portion and is it possible that um, because we can understand that it's because of the the level of revelation and about his ministry uh, what he had that's why it was given to him so is it possible that even now also um, you know this is possible to uh, like normal believers whom god has called and uh, he can be persecuted uh, that that is my question sir thank yeah. you uh, yeah thank you shikumar that's a wonderful question so the the ultimate thing was that uh, paul need to be humble because of the revelations that he has received right during that time now to answer the part where has god allowed it yeah because jesus says you know the lord jesus says uh, my grace is sufficient for you so the devil is doing his work he's doing it uh, he's trying to buffet you he's trying to bring all these troubles to you i'm not going to stop what he is doing but i'm going to increase my grace for you so apostle paul paul as my son as my child the enemy is going to come he's going to trouble you even more probably you you know you're going to go through this really difficult time next but even through those thorns through those buffeting of the devil i'll increase my grace my grace will i pour out my grace upon you that even in those sufferings you will be strengthened now how do we translate it now look at what's happening now now in the nation of india the uh, the anti conversion law has started right so uh, we cannot share the gospel now did god allow it is god for it obviously not but the devil is doing his work let's do this let's let's uh, create this law let's create this thing and then nobody can share it he's trying all he can but god is going to increase the grace for each one of us yes. will there be persecutions especially when you look at villages and towns uh, uh, where you know the, there is high persecution north of india I'm, i'm guessing even in africa there have been a lot of persecutions towards christians so will it stop god is not promising that but god is promising that i will increase my grace right so we must look at it this way shri kumar there are things that god can god will not stop the enemy from doing enemy is doing but here it's not like he's going to allow and then keep us in the same level no he's going to allow something god is going to increase our power he's going to increase our grace he's going to raise up people who be really anointed the power of the holy spirit so we look at it that way so paul is saying here so probably the lord jesus is saying uh, to paul i'm just picturing it i'm making a picture for you paul you have gone through all these difficulties now you have the thorn in the flesh meaning the thorn the devil is attacking you uh, and it's going to attack he's going to continue but i'm not going to stop that you're praying that i stop it for now i'm not going to do that but what i am going to do is i'm going to increase your anointing i'm going to increase the grace of god upon your life where wherever you go all lives will be touched all lives will be blessed so you look at this side of the picture don't look at that side paul persecution trials will continue but you look at this side of the picture my grace is sufficient for you i'm going to increase it I'm going to increase the anointing. I'm going to increase the power of God. I'm going to increase greater revelations in you, and probably you'll be able to do greater works. What happens after all of this? Remember, Paul goes into Malta. The snake bites him. He shakes off that snake. He doesn't die. Remember, he goes into uh, at the sea. He's going in the sea. the The storms come, and Paul says, "Everyone, stay in the ship. You will live." so it was not like after this there was no difficulties of course he was 3 years uh, in home imprisonment yet he was given uh, the freedom to you know share the gospel and all of that but he was there there were difficulties right but paul is saying god is saying i will increase the grace so look at the situation that we are in now probably maybe 5 years down the line things are going to be really 5 10 years down the line 
know, for Christians, for us as believers, things are maybe really difficult. There may be the enemy may come and just try to sweep over, and but God is going to increase the, His grace, His mercy, His anointing for us as believers. He's going to increase it so that we'll be able to defeat the works of the enemy. Right. So that's all. That's all. Sri Kumar, I hope that answers yes, a bit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank yes. you. Thank you, sir. Yes. yes. Uh, so, Christopher, the first, second, and the third heavens. Uh, the first heaven is the reality, what we see in our natural eye. Right? The heavens, what we see, that's the first heaven. The second heaven is where Satan and his throne and his fallen angels work. Remember Daniel is praying? Daniel is praying and he says, uh, the prayers didn't reach God. Why? Because the principalities and the powers of the the devil was hindering the prayers to reach, right? So that's the unholy dark realm, right? First heaven is the real thing that you see, the natural heavens, the beauty of the stars, the skies. Second heaven is where Satan and his demons, the fallen angels, the, the, the unholy dark realm, demonic works begin. That's the second heaven. And the third heaven is where God has his throne established right the celestial kingdom the kingdom of god where he rules and reigns so those are the three heavens and that's where uh the apostle paul he says i was caught up in the third heaven is that okay christopher right. okay so uh, we've almost come to the end uh, let me just let's just quickly try and finish it so that we can be done with this this class itself and all right so okay let's go to verse 11 quickly i have become a fool in boasting you have compelled me for i ought to have been commended by you for in nothing was i behind the most eminent apostles though i am nothing Truly, the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it in which you were inferior to the other churches, except that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. Now, Paul is not falling short in any of the qualities compared to the false apostles. And he's saying, hey, mine is much, much, much greater. Uh, uh, the things that we have done, uh, the the signs, wonders, and miracles, the mighty deeds, they were obviously done by the power of the Holy Spirit and not by any human work, right? Yes, let's let's just look at this passage, verse twenty-one. I think this is the last passage. Yes, this is the last passage. Okay, let's look at this. Now, this is his final uh, sayings for this chapter. Now for the third time, I'm ready to come to you. And I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. But be that as it may, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you by cunning. Did I take advantage of you by any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus and sent our brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? Again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I will be found by you such as as you do not wish, lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, and tumults. Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before, before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced now this will be paul's third visit to the corinthian church 
Remember the first one was when he went to Corinth. Second one, on the way to Macedonia, he goes, he sees the church, he sees the church is in complete disorder, and he's burdened and he's upset. And now he's going to come the third time. Right? And Paul was a spiritual father to the Corinthian believers. He shared the gospel with them. He brought them from immaturity to Christ like this. He corrected them and he cared for them. He was always had their best in their heart. That's why he says, I'm doing all this for your edification. Though you don't love me, I will still love you. Right? Look at my team. It's not only me. Look at Titus. Did he when he came when he came, did he ask you for money? Did he uh you know use you in any way? No. Right. But Paul here, his his only fear is that when he visits the Corinthian church, that if there is still divisions, turmoils, outposts of anger, and all these carnal things, he will have to mourn because they were like his children. Mourn that they have lived an unrepentant, sinful lifestyle. But you know what? The main reason Paul is coming is to handle those false prophets who have come into the church. He says, I'm going to come now. He doesn't mention it. He doesn't say that I've come, I'm going to handle those false prophets. I'm going to chase them away from He doesn't say it. But Paul knows his presence itself there will make the difference. Because where there is truth, lies will fall away. Nobody can stand against the Holy Spirit. When the Apostle Paul comes to Corinth, those false prophets will run away. They will not even come. So the main reason he's coming is not that he wants to take the gifts to the church in Jerusalem, because that he's already told Titus and the team to do. But he's coming so that he can get rid of these people who have infiltrated the church, the false prophets and these false teachers. So what do we see here? Paul is taking this decision. Even though he didn't want to see them uh, because of the, what they are doing, but Paul knew that it's important for him to go because the church needs to be protected. You see the heart of a shepherd. I have to go. If I don't go, these people will keep listening to these false prophets, these false teachings, this false Jesus, this false spirit they're talking about, and then all my efforts will go in vain. So I have to go. I have to protect them. They are my children. Even though you don't love me, even though you are uh, you know, not too keen of me coming, I will come. Make sure I make things right. And now chapter 13, he's saying, I'm coming, but I'm coming with authority. Right Now, verse 1. This will be the third, this is the final chapter. This will be the third time I'm coming to you. By, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. I've told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time. Right? Uh, let's let's just go down. For though was for for though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? unless indeed you are disqualified, but I trust that you will know that we are, that Paul is encouraging the church, right? He's saying, I'm going to come. Christ died in weakness, yet he lives powerful. We will come in weakness, but yet the power of the Holy Spirit will speak. Examine yourselves, test your faith. What are they preaching? What are they teaching? Examine it. Test it. Don't let anyone disqualify you. In fact, we are not disqualified because we are God's children. Right? Paul asked those to test him in the manner to in turn examine themselves and see if they were indeed in the Christian faith and not disqualified. It's not like you just because uh, you know I came, you heard about it, and you received the gospel. No. Test yourself, test your life, and test it, and see if it is in line with what God, uh, with what God is doing, and see if it's in line with God's word, right? And 
Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do what is honorable, that we may seem disqualified, though we may seem disqualified. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we were, we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray, that you may be made complete. Therefore, I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness. Again, he's saying that, according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. Right? So Paul is gently telling the church, you've got to make things right. We can only speak of the truth and not against the truth. So I'm writing this to you now, though I'm absent, because if I was present there, I would have been sharp, I would have been stern, I would have been, uh, you know, I would have sternly corrected you. But this sternness comes from the authority that the Lord has given us. Again, not to bring destruction, but to bring edification. Right? So Paul's prayer, every believer be equipped thoroughly, be strong in the word of God. Uh, and, and he's, you know, he writes these beforehand and he's giving them these instructions so that when he comes there, he doesn't have to be sharp, he doesn't have to be stern. So basically, Paul is saying, I don't want to come. Last time I came, I saw what's happening. I was stern and I wrote one stern letter. Now, second time when I come, I don't want to do the same thing. I want to spend time with you, probably to see a change in you. Titus has come back and said that there's a change in you, but there are other things that you're letting inside the church. So let's make things right. And he gives his final greetings and benediction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So in this closing episode, Paul greets the believers, wishes them well, reminds them of the instructions. Uh, and again, greet one another with a holy kiss, with a cultural equivalent during those times. Uh, they greet another with a holy kiss, but right now we can do it with a handshake. Uh, that is prevalent in the culture that we are in now. Paul, Paul again pronounces the blessings to the believers, uh, which indeed is the, the triune God, the love, the, what we call as the benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship or the communion of the Holy Spirit. Be with you. It, it looks like a quite a abrupt ending. Uh, and the reason it, it sounds a bit abrupt is because. Uh, Paul is going to visit them. And every time he, now he knew that he's going to visit them, and I'm sure he's going to get rid of those false apostles and prophets. Right, so it's been a long session. It's been a long course. Uh, I want to encourage each one of us to continue to study this, continue to read it, and uh, let it be a blessing. Thank you so much for joining along. I really enjoyed just being there, just studying and teaching and looking forward to study more of it. I'll put the final assessment maybe today or tomorrow. Uh, all the best uh, for your finals, uh, uh, final assessments. Thank you so much uh, for being patient and joining with, with me. And uh, uh, shall we just quickly close with a word of prayer? All right, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful day, God. Thank you for this entire course that we've been able to complete, Lord. Yet there's so much to learn, so much to apply in our life. And I pray, God, that each one of us uh, will grow to maturity, will grow and will apply all that we have learned, Lord, applied in our lives, for our families, and be equipped and matured in Christ and build us, Lord, that we may glorify your name in all that we do and all that we say. We thank you, Lord. I pray for each and every student, Lord. May your your wisdom, your strength be upon them, O oh God. And I pray, God, that you'd use each one of us for your glory. We thank you, Father. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great 
month and uh, wishing you all a blessed Christmas season as well. Uh, God bless. Take care. Bye.